In this video, I'd like to talk about the idea of conservation of mechanical energy. So first, I'd like to define what mechanical energy is. The mechanical energy of an object is the kinetic energy of the object plus the potential energy of the object. So if I have an object that's moving from some initial point I to a final position F, and there are conservative and non-conservative forces doing work, then if I look at the work done by all of the conservative forces added together, and I also look at the work done by all of the non-conservative forces added together, then the total work done on the object is the work done by the conservative forces plus the work done by the non-conservative forces added together. Again, this is just what net work means. The net work means find the work done by each of the individual forces and then add all of the works together. We're grouping all of the works done by conservative forces in one piece and all of the works done by non-conservative forces in the other piece, but this is just the idea of net work equaling all of the works added together. And previously we talked about the work energy theorem, that the net work done on an object equals the change in kinetic energy of the object. In this case, where we have conservative and non-conservative forces acting, the work done by the conservative forces plus the work done by the non-conservative forces together are the net work done. And so the change in kinetic energy of the object is the work done by all the conservative forces added together plus the work done by all the non-conservative forces added together. In the last video, we related potential energy with conservative forces. And we said specifically that the change in potential energy of an object equals the opposite of the work done by the conservative force that's associated with that potential energy. Again, something like gravitational potential energy is associated with the gravitational force. So the change in gravitational potential energy is the opposite of the work done by the gravitational force. So this has it rearranged a little bit. The work done by the conservative forces equals the opposite of the change in potential energy. But this allows us to plug that in if I plug in negative delta U in for the work done by the conservative forces, I have delta K equals negative delta U plus the work done by non-conservative forces. If I take delta U to the other side, it becomes positive. And so the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy equals the work done by the non-conservative forces. But kinetic energy and potential energy, those are the two pieces of mechanical energy. So if I look at the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy, that is the change in the mechanical energy of the object. And so if we look at the case where we have no non-conservative forces doing work, then the mechanical energy of the object stays constant. This is what the law of conservation of mechanical energy is. If there are no non-conservative forces doing work, the mechanical energy stays constant. The mechanical energy is conserved. This is why conservative forces are referred to as conservative. If there's only conservative forces acting, then those forces conserve or keep constant the mechanical energy of the object. Another way of stating that law of conservation of mechanical energy is that the potential energy plus the kinetic energy at the beginning has to equal the potential energy plus the kinetic energy at the end. The individual values might be different, but the total mechanical energy at the beginning and the total mechanical energy at the end is what stays constant. And so if we have no non-conservative forces doing work, we can use this idea of conservation of mechanical energy, that the initial potential energy plus the initial kinetic energy will equal the final potential energy plus the final kinetic energy. And really, the way that I prefer to write it is the potential energy at point A plus the kinetic energy at point A equals the potential energy at point B plus the kinetic energy at point B. That the total mechanical energy at point A has to equal the total mechanical energy at point B. It doesn't matter if we're talking about the beginning position or some point in the middle. The total mechanical energy at any point has to equal the total mechanical energy at any other point. So if I know the total mechanical energy at one point, I know what the total mechanical energy is at any point along the motion if there are no non-conservative forces doing work.
in a later video will also include how to look at conservation of energy problems if there are non-conservative forces as well. Now I'd like to look at a few simple examples showing how to use conservation of energy to solve problems. In this first problem, we have a child with a mass of 40 kilograms that's sliding down a water slide, and the height of the water slide is 8.5 meters. And we're going to assume that the slide is frictionless because of the water on it. So there's no friction acting. There's no work done by the non-conservative force of friction. And we want to find the speed of the child at the bottom of the slide. So first of all, the fact that this child is released from rest is going to be important. That tells us something about the kinetic energy at the beginning. This child is moving vertically, so we have gravitational potential energy changing. The equation for gravitational potential energy is mgh, where h is the height measured relative to some height that we call zero. And so that's one of the first things you have to do in these problems, is pick where your height is going to be zero. Here, a convenient place to pick is the bottom of the slide. We know that the person is starting 8.5 meters above the bottom of the slide, so if, we call, so if we call the bottom of the slide where the height is zero, that means that the initial height is 8.5 meters. So I'm going to call that initial point, point one, and the final point, point two. The potential energy at point one is 40 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times 8.5 meters, which is 3,332 joules. The kinetic energy at point one is one half times the mass, 40 kilograms, times the speed, zero squared. So the initial kinetic energy is zero. It's not always going to be zero, but in this case, because the child is released from rest, the initial kinetic energy is zero. I can calculate the potential energy at point two, the bottom of the slide. The potential energy at point two is 40 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times zero meters. The height is zero at the bottom of the slide. So the potential energy at the bottom of the slide is zero. And we're going to be looking for the kinetic energy at the bottom of the slide, which we then can use to find the speed at the bottom of the slide. Because there are no non-conservative forces acting, the mechanical energy is conserved. The mechanical energy stays constant. And so we can use the conservation of mechanical energy equation, that the potential energy plus the kinetic energy at point one has to equal the potential energy plus the kinetic energy at point two. The potential energy at point one is 3,332 joules. The kinetic energy at point one is zero joules. The potential energy at point two is zero joules, and we are looking for the kinetic energy at point two. And so this tells us that the kinetic energy at point two is 3,332 joules. And since I know the kinetic energy, and kinetic energy is one half mv squared, I can use that to find the speed. One half times 40 kilograms times the unknown speed v squared equals 3,332 joules, or the speed is 12.907 meters per second. Notice in this case, at the beginning, all of the energy was potential energy. At the end, all of the energy was kinetic energy, but that's not always going to be true. It can have both kinetic energy and potential energy at a point. If we were looking at partway down the slide, partway down the slide, the the child would have had some potential energy and some kinetic energy, but the total would still equal the total that we had at the beginning, 3,332 joules. And now it's the same child on the slide, but instead of looking for the speed at the bottom, let's find the speed of the child when the child is five meters from the bottom of the slide. So this is a case where the child's part way down, and so she's going to have some potential energy and some kinetic energy when she's at a height of five meters. At the beginning, it's the same that we had before. At point one, the potential energy was 3,332 joules. The kinetic energy at point one, she still started from rest, so the kinetic energy at point one is zero joules. And so now I'm going to look at the energies at point two, which is at a height of five meters. The potential energy at point two is 40 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times five meters, which is 1,960 joules. And so at point two, some of the energy is potential, some of the energy is kinetic, but I know 
that the total energy still has to add up to equal the total mechanical energy that it had at the beginning. The initial mechanical energy of 3,332 joules has to equal the potential energy at point two, 1,960 joules, plus the kinetic energy at point two. This gives us that the kinetic energy at point two is 1,372 joules. And again, kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. So that gives us that the speed is 8.283 meters per second. Again, by knowing what the total mechanical energy was at one location, we know what the total needed to be at some other location. And so if we know how much of it is potential, then we know how much of it is kinetic. Or if we know how much of it is kinetic, we know how much of it is potential. And so the fact that we know what the total is allows us to find the quantity that we're looking for. In this third example problem, it's still the same child being released from rest, but instead of looking at the speed at the bottom of the slide, or instead of looking at the speed at a height of five meters, we're looking for at what height above the bottom of the slide does the child have a speed of four meters per second. So again, the potential energy at the top of the slide is still 3,332 joules. The kinetic energy at the top of the slide is still zero. But now, at point two, I know the speed, but I don't know the height. So the kinetic energy at point two is one-half times 40 kilograms times four meters per second, that quantity squared, which is 320 joules. And I don't know how much of it is potential energy. So the potential energy plus the kinetic energy at the top of the slide has to equal the potential energy plus the kinetic energy at point two. So 3,332 joules has to equal the potential energy at point two plus 320 joules, the kinetic energy at point two. That tells us that the potential energy at point two had to be 3,012 joules. Again, the potential energy plus the kinetic energy together have to add up to equal the mechanical energy that I had at the beginning. Gravitational potential energy is mgh, so I can use this to find the height. So 3,012 joules equals 40 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times h, where that gives me a height of 7.68 meters. Again, we knew that this height was going to be above five meters, because in the last slide we saw that the speed at a height of five meters was faster than four meters per second. Again, at any point in the motion, the total mechanical energy has to equal what it equaled at the beginning. The total mechanical energy at the top of the slide has to equal the total mechanical energy at any other point as the child goes down the slide. But the important thing is the potential energy and the kinetic energy both have to be looked at at the same point. And this is the same example except the mass of the child isn't given. So sometimes you'll be given a problem like this where the mass isn't given. So I want to show how this problem would work. Instead of putting in 40 kilograms for the mass, we're just going to use m. So the potential energy at the top of the slide is m times 9.8 times 8.5. The kinetic energy at the top of the slide is still zero. The potential energy at the bottom of the slide is still zero. The kinetic energy at the bottom of the slide is one half m times v squared. And so the potential energy plus the kinetic energy at the top of the slide equals the potential energy plus the kinetic energy at the bottom of the slide. If we look at that, m times 9.8 times 8.5 plus zero equals zero plus a half times m times v squared. We see that the mass divides out. The mass of this child didn't matter. The speed at the bottom of the slide is still 12.907 meters per second, just like we found in the first example that we looked at. Whether this is a child with a mass of 40 kilograms going down the slide, or an adult with a mass of 80 kilograms going down the slide, if they started from rest at the top and there's no friction, then that speed at the bottom of the slide is going to be the same for each of those people. In some other videos, we're going to look at more complicated conservation of energy problems problems where you have more than one type of potential energy, or situations where we have non-conservative forces acting. And so we can see how do we include those non-conservative forces doing work with our conservation of energy idea. But these few examples show the idea of conservation of energy. 
these problems are really the same types of things that we would have looked at with the work energy theorem that we would have done a problem like this by finding the work done by gravity and using that work done equaling the change in kinetic energy to get the speed of the object but the idea of conservation of energy is just a little bit easier you kind of put everything together it's usually a little bit easier for people to keep track of all of their terms and solve them using the conservation of energy idea as opposed to the work energy idea.